Um, yeah, I only have one monitor right now, so going to be fun. Um, and yeah, please. Yeah, let me know if you've got questions. Um, interrupt me. I can't really see the chat, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, but yeah, this is the second um, second chapter on dependencies. So some of this will be a review from last time. Um, but in general, it's supposed to be more practical and less high level. So really how to work with dependencies in the various parts of your package. So within your functions itself, within the test of your functions, within the examples that um, show up for the function, and with vignettes and articles. So um, first of all, so uh, imports, it's like poorly named. And this is a, just a reminder from last week. Um, but it only makes sure that the package is installed. Uh, it does not do anything to load or attach the package. It just looks to see if it's already there. And if it's not, it installs it. Um, and also, so packages in imports do not have to appear in the namespace file, but every package in namespace has to exist in the imports. Um, so this is uh, like you can use namespace is a smaller subsection sub subset of functions that are in your namespace or in, via importing from other people's namespaces or and the things that you're exporting out as part of part of your namespace. But imports includes all sorts of things that you use throughout your package. And anytime if like you only ever use it with the namespace operator, so the colon colon, then it wouldn't necessarily show up in your namespace anywhere. But the package is needed, so it will show up in the um, description file and under the import section. Um, or the depend section, which they generally don't recommend, but it does get mentioned as a as a thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is um, totally just copy and pasted from the great presentation that Trevin did last time. So just the load and attach refresher, um, because right, it got mentioned that, that what importing does is it just imports and it doesn't load or attach. Um, so we need library. Both of these things happen as a user. Um, and um, these, this table becomes helpful in the package for, uh, sorry, in the package development process for um, making use of other packages, dependencies. Um, this one is the one that is most often used in uh, package development with require namespace. So if it's not loaded, it will return false. And um, that's the one that we'll mostly use. And then there is this detail about if you access the namespace, if you access the function from the namespace with the colon colon operator, namespace operator, it will also load the package if it wasn't already. Um, and this packet, uh, in this chapter, we also learn about using the colon colon operator for the purpose of DevTools check, um, but that comes up later. So uh, I think. Is that it? Sorry. <laughs> All right. So conventions. Um, so we have our happy cycle package name package. And we have, again, these um, two packages that we might depend on. And this function is a function that we're going to use in our package that exists in, oops, sorry, in AAA package. Um, so the namespace workflow. So the namespace file itself keeps track of how you're importing functions from another package and what you're exporting, what functions you're exporting from, from the package we're creating. Um, it also, it's so it's generated from comments in your R files that exist under this R directory. Um, and so we don't create the namespace at all ourselves directly. That's what Roxygen does. Um, and that's why the first the first comment within the namespace file is this, hey, this was created by Roxygen too. Don't edit by hand. And so you, you need to regenerate this file often um, as you're importing and exporting functions or methods. Um, so the general workflow is that 
they go through at first a um like a kind of hypothetical workflow and then they refine it with some with a comment but in general you add these oxygen tags to your function um, i don't think the order matters here um and you've got import fun from which means that in this package aaa this function exists and we are going to bring this function into our workspace sorry into the, like the, our namespace so we don't have to refer we can use this function anytime we want without having to use the namespace operator without ever having to refer to this package again we can just use it freely and so here we decided we also needed bvb package because we're using so many functions from it we're just importing the whole thing um, and so now, you know, there better not be any namespace conflicts between what we intended to write and what existed in this BBB package. And also, um, yeah, so we never have to refer to BBB package. We can access all of these, all of the functions from it without, um, without ever doing the namespace operator style. And so this is a function. So I need to stop doing that. <laughs> this is a function that we're exporting. So this function will be available to the user um, and like package colon colon function, um, they could access foo. So um, we do this and then we run DevTools document. It'll update our help and it will regenerate the namespace and the namespace file. And so again, this is gonna be at the top of the namespace file, a reminder that you don't edit this by hand. Um, and it's going to have these exports and the imports and the imports from, and they're, um, so one thing that they do mention is that there's no, um, there's no like function for deleting things from your namespace. So that could be a place where you would actually go in and manually, um, change something if, if you'd originally called this and you want to change that. Um, that being said, I think I do have a question for this later because I want to get into continuous integration, but um, not not there yet. So, all right. So now, um, oh, actually, let me go back one more mention. So when you are doing this and then you hit document um, or you hit command shift D, um, it will regenerate your namespace and you can export functions as well as methods and how that looks in the resulting namespace file is different, but there's not a separate Roxygen tag. Um, it's smart enough to figure out which is which. Um, so I should get the syntax correct. Um, so how do you deal with packages um, that are listed in your imports section in your description file. So as a reminder, things you list in imports are needed by your users and will be installed if they don't exist. Um, and they'll be updated if it exists, but you listed a higher, a dependency on a higher um, version than the user has installed. And uh, yeah, so you know that they're installed. You can assume that anything that's listed as imports is installed whenever your package is installed. And, um, but, so you know it exists, but in general, almost all the time, if possible, you wanna use this syntax, the namespace operator syntax, where you put tplyr colon colon mutate um, whenever you make use of it. And if you do that, then this nothing about dplyr and mutate show up in your namespace and you don't have to do any of the import from things, um, but you can just use it throughout your code in any of your code in your function code. And um, this is preferable when possible because it avoids importing this package into your namespace, which could be pretty cluttered. Um, your namespace kind of in general, my understanding is that you wanna keep it as limited as reasonable. Um, and it's also for you, easy to see what functions you made versus what functions are dependent on other packages, which you probably remember when you're writing the code, but you might not remember later when you're revisiting things. 
and you know it minimizes name conflicts. So the exceptions to when you might not want to just use this syntax is um, you can't use it if you're calling an operator, which I did not realize. Um, and an example they gave is the null, null coalescing operator, which is um, here in Arling. And um, yeah, so I think this is similar to the coalesce function, which is what I use instead. But this looks pretty cool. And um, it is coming to base R, fun fact. Um, yeah, so I don't know when, I don't know how often those things get pushed, but it is coming to base R at some point. And um, you, if you wanted to use that within your code, you couldn't just call um, Rlang. So in that case, you would not be able to use this syntax and you would then need to actually import um, the, the function. So also you might wanna import a function if it's something that you use a lot um, but you know, if you use a lot and yet you can happily use this, then just use the namespace operator, namespace syntax. But if it makes your code more readable, um, or if it helps with users and their error messages, then you might want to just use the import from and bring it fully into your code. And if you use a function a ton, um, you can also use that. That's also a reason to justify bringing the, sorry, a ton being if it's used in a in a loop that operates millions of times, um, the performance, so there you do get a small performance hit if you ooh, um, if you do the namespace operator versus importing the function in, but they say it's on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So this really matters very rarely. Oh, okay. Other examples of, uh, of operators that you might need might want to use. So if you are making an exception and you're using, you want to import this into your um, code, then you, you want to import this function into your package, then you need to make a oxygen tag. So there are two places you can play, put your oxygen tag. So they start with this one, which is what I would be inclined to do and what this example, do, 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 oh, sorry, whatever, the earlier example about foo does, which is just put it as close to your use of your function that you're writing. So um, just like right above it, or you can put it in a central location. Um, so you can put it as close as possible to the external function, to the function that you're writing for your package. And that makes sense um, for a while, but they kind of say as things get more uh, as your package grows and you're reliant, you're doing this in multiple places, you're importing functions and important importing um, pa uh, packages in various locations throughout your code that ends up getting unwieldy pretty fast. And um, so they recommend this style whereby you have a central location docu uh, documentation file. And the convention is that it's packaged. So I need, really need to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> that it's packaged, so cplier-package.r, um, and then that that file has all of your imports and import froms, as well as some other things. Um, so if you wanna use use this use import from, it will by default plop the Roxygen tag in this documentation file. So this documentation file gets added to a build ignore, so, um, it's it's not like shipped with your package unless your package is in source. No, I don't know. Oh, let's not let's not say that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So use this use import from by default sticks things here, um, and then it updates your documentation. Um, so your markdown files and stuff and uh, calls load all. So all of your functions are available to you as the developer. So um, I just wanted to look at an example of. Uh, of one of these documentation files since I wasn't super aware of them. So parsnip. Um, so this right here, not important. I, <laughs> I mean, it, so this comes up um, when you hit help, it'll give this description of the parsnip file. Um, and then you've got all these import froms 
and um, you can see that they don't actually, uh, oh, this is our import prompts, okay. Um, so all of the functions that you need that you import um, individually are listed out here. So that was kind of cool. So, whoops, that's definitely done. Um, so yeah, importing an entire namespace is very rare, or it should be rare. I don't know, but it's rare, and is the least recommended way of getting packages um, and, and their functions available to you as you're writing your R code. So if there's a really tight integration um, and there's it's minimal size and there's um, like a careful lack of name conflicts. Um, then, then it's done. And so Arlang is one of these examples where they feel like it's a pretty safe thing to import the entire namespace of. Um, yeah, there are the downsides that we mentioned earlier, but um, sometimes it is done. So uh, here's a small detail. So sometimes you have a package that you've listed in imports because the user needs to have it installed in order to run your package. But you don't ever call a function from it. Um, so your code doesn't ever include this. So this is actually interesting. I left this in. This <laughs> Maybe John, someone can speak up about this. Um, okay, glue. The answer so, is glue. <laughs> really? Yes. Okay, I, I've so done I'll... it many times with glue. So if you are using um, CLI? Well, it... no, I don't think that's my question. OK. Because so this is the old version of notes, and I had changed this. So well, maybe you're right. OK, so they, all right, I'll, they, give, <laughs> um, they give examples of, and you're totally going to be right about this. <laughs> they give examples of um, using, the, the way this could happen is if your um, your package like has a recursive dependency on something. So, and it, um, so like it depends on a package and that package depends on something else, but your version of depends has a higher level of um, um, also we're on imports when I'm speaking of depending on, but um, as a higher version level that it needs, I think. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, okay. Or like, so it's all these, it's a, it's a recursive thing. It needs to happen. It needs to be like two levels down or that it is, your package depends on something that has a suggest on something else, but you actually needs to be an import for you. So, um, because they suggest, you know, I'm, I'm using some, <laughs> spatial package, whatever. And they suggested this thing and they put it in suggests because they don't use, it's only used on an, an ad hoc function, right? But that's the function that our package is using. So we list it, we list SF as import, SF lists something else as suggests, but we actually need, need that as an import. So we list it as import, but none of our code specifically calls that because SF is calling that the function that we're using. Um, so in that case, you're going to get an, a note for a, a warning, a, a note from our command check that says namespaces in imports fields are not imported. All declared imports should be used because they think you put something in imports and it was like unnecessary. And so they're giving you a warning about a, a note, <laughs> a heads up about this. So those are the two examples that were given in the book. Um, but here, there's mention of it also being in the function argument calling the same thing. And now I will turn it over to John to explain why that also <laughs> happens because I didn't it, try. So it. the one that I get all the time or have gotten in the past and now I usually just deal with it is uh, glue is in suggests for CLI, but anytime you have the curly braces in a CLI message, you are using glue and so if you use curly braces, you need glue. And so you have to put it into imports to make sure that it comes along. Um, but okay. you'll get this warning. And so, right. yeah, that's where you just- This note warning. 
Okay. Yeah. So do you think this, I, I, do you think this is a true statement? I should have gone back and watched the video to see where, when this is added, but the default for a function argument, do you think that? I can't remember. I think it might be, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see that in the book, but that totally doesn't mean it's not true. Maybe I should delete right. the first edition. Um, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> so you don't want to just uh, call, so our command check wants you to have used everything that you say a user needs to use. So it's in imports, but you didn't use this package anywhere. So you're going to create an extra file and you create a function. And this function is never called, it's not exported, um, but it just lists the functions that um, have this problem, like John mentioned, the glue example. So all you have to do is, um, yeah, list the function. So you don't you don't even have the um, parentheses here. This is just so this would like return this function, not return a call to the function. But again, you never use it. You don't do anything with it. Um, yeah. So that that doing it this way is like the minimal minimal way of getting around this error without actually polluting your namespace more um, or insisting on more things being loaded. Um, and so this function is generally put in the package wide setup file that we mentioned earlier. So if you go down here, ah, oh, they don't have one. Okay. Um, but I bet we could find another one really quickly. <laughs> um, so if I went to, um, what? Broom is so old though. I don't know if it's gonna have different, let's try it. So I've got a package setup wide file, hopefully called broom package. Ooh, they also don't have a um, any need for this. I am pretty certain that this is a really new suggestion, so That's it might fair. be hard to find. Like, That's totally fair. I, I had I had read this previously and didn't realize that this is the recommendation now because I don't I've never seen this, um, or I just missed it the last time. But um, it's interesting. That's fair. I totally saw it when I was poking around earlier, but yeah, um, I'm looking at the the book right now, and so I didn't save it. So, <laughs> um, let's see, Dev Tools package. Dear okay. Huh. Yeah, all right, fine. Dev Tools package has it. So <laughs> we've got these three um, unused imports. And maybe this is the only package that uses this convention. <laughs> it's um, very possible. I did not I... search uh, uh, GitHub for this, but they they never, this exists in the same um, package. What do they call this? Um, uh, package uh, level package, documentation or something Package level like documentation, that. yeah. So here, if you, um, well, if we were to call help on, Dev tools, it would tell us these things. Um, and then this never gets called anywhere else. It exists only here. And it's just for the purposes of um, avoiding that note from Cram. Yeah, um, I was trying to look at um, like packages that have been updated fairly recently that, that they did their spring cleaning or whatever on. Yeah. So I looked at Hitter 2 because they were just doing yeah. that, you know, in the fall. And uh, it uses, it has import from glue glue, which is the sign of, you know, they did that. They did cool. the same trick, the old trick of just to use import from. Okay. I think, I mean, I, I, I don't, I haven't checked to make sure, but usually actually hitter two probably just actually uses glue directly. I don't know. Um, It's interesting. I hadn't seen that. Yeah, they don't have anyone getting around it here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> if you want to be cool like the DevTools package authors, you can do that. Um, well, DevTools package authors now are uh, Jenny. And so you know, she, I mean, you that's probably where it. she tried it <laughs> yeah. when she was writing this chapter. Um, okay. So 
that's how you deal with packages listed in imports in your R code. So R slash your code stuff. So in your tests, same thing. Um, and you ideally, um, well, you need to call them this way um, unless you've imported them, um, <laughs> unless you've imported the namespace. Um, but in general, you should stick with this. And uh, really don't use library within your test because that will persist to your other tests. So you're gonna be testing things in an environment um, in the, um, that is gonna be different than the user using your package. So um, don't do that. Hi. Um, and I just wanted to interrupt for um, yes. Stas's question uh, that he had in uh, Slack about yes. that. Of, Okay, so why is it okay that test that is library? And I mean, I think the, that's just because it would be painful to have to namespace every single test. And they're figuring if you are importing, if you're legitimately importing test that, then you're going to be ready to deal with that, I think is basically the idea. Um, so I kind of have a follow up question to that. Okay. So within the philosophy of dependencies, and you probably know the answer to that, John. Is it a kind of zero dependency package in, in that it does not have its own dependencies or it has its like Arlang or something? Um, let me see. Uh, it's, I'm not on, on my, it's my computer right now, yeah. Yeah, it's know. relatively low, but it's not It's not nothing, but it, it is. Well, it, it's, it's probably using like CLI. Yeah, and it uses, it has, I mean, it has like caller. Um, I can't, Brio does some fancy things, but it, it's not, it's not that light, but it's in suggests of everything because yeah. you only need it, like you don't need it in order to install or use most packages. You just need it if you are developing and want to run the tests. So, it's different. <laughs> yeah, it imports a fair amount. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and, you know, just a, a side conversation there that if it's stuff that's only for development, I think you should feel pretty okay, like with big imports, like, or not imports, but, um, you know, these things that are in suggest, they can be pretty hefty because only the developers need to install them, which is mostly just you. And, you know, if anyone is working, I mean, it shouldn't be a huge pain to install because then you're stopping anyone from helping you. Um, but they don't need to be, you know, like you don't need to run them on your, um, you know, where any uh, servers where you're doing daily builds of uh, some pipeline or something, you know, you don't need to test that there. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, I do still expect equal from time to time. Uh, I mean, I know that it's it goes to something in Waldo package, right? To check the quality, but it's it's a it's a it's damn handy function. <laughs> <laughs> it it is useful, but you know, if you need to, you can strip strip it down to what you actually need, and yeah, uh, yeah. tan. Ask the smart ass question of someone tell me if arrow is okay and suggests if people aren't aware. Uh, arrow is probably, I haven't heard if there's an update, but it's probably leaving CRAN apparently. Oh, what? Oh man, this is what I get for not being on. Yeah. So because it uses arrow, um, it's too big of a server or an installed something something like i don't i don't understand the whole thing but the um like installation dependency is breaking some rule and they're like well we can't not use arrow in arrow so what do we do um so anyway uh mm -hmm. watch out <laughs> um like I, I don't know it's one of these where i'm like I can't believe that they're really going to do this, but 
Well, uh, right oh, now, we it's, 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 a, it's a DF version for what it's worth. I, I just installed it today. It was 14.002. And like, DF version on CRAN, it's radical. <laughs> Yeah, still working as of an hour ago. Um, Sixteen minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so that... well, that's an example of heavy dependencies, so, right? So they're depending on some some C plus plus libraries that are not working. That's what discussion was. Yeah, but the C plus plus library is Arrow, right? <laughs> Anyway, um, this is uh, this is going to be interesting. That is really good to know. Okay, yeah. so um, where did we leave? Okay, test code. Yeah, that's what we just covered. Um, generally, don't use library. Although, um, yeah, definitely don't use library in your test. We just learned about test that being an exception. Um, okay, so and in your examples and vignettes. You can just um, do it however you like. You can use a library because in your examples and vignettes, you can use a library call to a package and you can also just um, use a namespace reference so that people know where, where that function comes from. Um, so moving on to packages that are listed in your suggests in your description file. So these are for things that are needed for development or that are um, like used in some edge cases or en enhanced functionality for a couple of your functions. So the idea is that you should not assume that a user has a suggest package installed, but you can assume that a developer does. So um, uh, not totally sure why this showed up right here, but um, <laughs> when you install a package, um, via either install that package, remotes, or pack. The default for all of these functions is to um, not install suggest things. They all take an argument that can change that, but for all of them, you cannot assume that that um, your users have it. The defaults assume that they do not install suggested things. So um, in the code that you've written for your functions below this, the R directory, um, you should um, figure out whether or not your user has this package installed. And so there are kind of two types of functions that you might have. And so one is where your function just does not work without this required package, like like no user, just that you can't, you can't use this if you're not going to install that thing. Or you've got the example of a function where the suggested package improves things, enhances something, but is not totally necessary. So if in the first situation where the, the thing in suggests is truly required and you can't run this function without it, um, you can look for if the namespace is um, there. This will give you a false if it's not um, and return a helpful error message to your user. And they don't, your, your, your error message is helpful. So you don't need to tell them where this, um, what call this function was in. Um, and then this will happen if someone doesn't have it installed and it'll just error out. And otherwise um, you can continue with your useful function. So if you've got the example where someone, um, where your function can run, if the um, user doesn't have the cool suggested package, then you can just write an if else again with this require namespace. Um, to help you just figure out whether or not someone has that available to them. Um, so this is how you could do it if Arling didn't exist, but since Arling exists, there's even a nicer way to do that. Um, so um, Arling improves this thing a little bit um, in part because you can look for multiple packages at the same time. So, and you can provide it a reason. So um, this reason will be used uh, during the error message. Um, uh, yeah, this is when it's required. So this will be used during the error message. Um, it'll also be used at some other point. I forgot when. Um, and it'll fail if um, 
yeah, if you don't have it. And so if it's optional, you can use your rlang is installed function. Um, and I don't totally remember. Oh, because you can you could call multiple things here. Um, I don't remember what the other benefits are. Um, but you can call multiple packages here if you depend on a couple. And uh, yeah, you can run it that way. So you've got the package in suggests. It's not needed very often. What do you do about tests? So we assume that everyone who's testing things has everything in suggests. So just write your tests as if they have it. Um, however, if you need to write a test and you want to um, and you want to allow for the fact that someone might not have one of your collaborative developers might not have that. There are tests that um, test that functions that um, skip that uh, allow for you to to specify that. So there are some very cumbersome packages like spatial packages that uh, to that are cumbersome to install. So um, in general, they assume that all developers have all pa suggested packages installed, but um, if you know that there are some occasionally problematic packages, you can use test that functionality to, to skip. So if you want to use a suggested package in a, an example or a vignette, um, which you probably want to show a vignette of how to use something cool that you wrote, um, then this is where you would actually use require and um, So you can write your vignette um, with the assumption that you've got all the packages needed in the suggests, and um, it will just like not render. It'll, it'll fail if you've if, if that doesn't, but you can operate under the assumption that it's being built in an environment that has the suggests. Um, but if for some reason you think it might sometimes be built in an environment that doesn't have that, or um, I don't know if built is the right word here, then you can use the eval, chat, eval, eval code chunk option. Um, so finally, you've got depends. Again, like this is almost never happens. Um, no, thank you for that DRAM. Um, so it almost never happens, um, but it does occasionally that you have something in depends versus rather than imports. Most of that is just historical. Um, also, it sounds like it's a place you should put things, but there are a couple of places in modern usage where you'd still use, where people still use depends rather than imports. So depends is very similar to imports, but there's one packet, one um, big, big difference, which is that imports doesn't change your namespace whatsoever because it just says, yeah, that package is there. Um, but depends attaches, um, it, if you have a package in depends, it is attached when your package is attached. So, um, Basically, that doesn't um, that that's not super. Uh, that it's not a big change. You can just treat it generally like it's imports, um, and you can use the same treatment for how to call packages that are in imports. Um, aside from the fact that uh, you don't have to um, use library in your examples and vignettes, so because you know that as, as long as the code, you can just call your own package in the vignette. So um, an example of this is um, censored package. It like really, so it's in the tidy models universe and it really doesn't make any sense for it to exist without the survival package. So survival is listed in depends, I believe. Let's confirm this. Um, You're muted. Uh, Rebecca, you're muted. I am muted. That's interesting. OK. Um, <laughs> so yeah, censored is an example of a place where they use um, they use to, they use depends on, because it really doesn't make sense to have 
um, survive, to run censored without survival. And apparently they also have a dependency on, and to run censored outside the parsnip environment or to run censor, you can't apparently be on a lower level of R. So um, yeah, so here survival is used here. So then in their vignettes, they're not gonna need to call um, survival explicitly. So that's the distinction. Um, because as long as censored is called library utils, that's, yeah, so this is it. Okay. Um, it, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, anytime they call censored survival is also attached. So they don't need to library, uh, and loaded. Um, so they don't need to specifically deal with it there. Um, so yeah, that's the difference for depends, which almost nobody will use. The other example they gave was um, ggforce does depends on ggplot because like you're never trying to use ggforce without ggplot. So don't worry about namespace conflicts. These things are meant to be used very um, integrated. So, okay, the next thing you get into is that um, you might have a non-standard dependency. So you might have something that doesn't, um, that depends on a package that does not exist on CRAN or Bioconductor. So that that's okay, sort of. It can't exist on <laughs> CRAN, um, but you should still follow these practices. Um, so I actually think this should be imported into the notes. Um, so if you've got, we've got our package that depends on a package, uh, that's all fine. Our package can exist on CRAN and this is all Hunky dory. Um, but then actually they like fix it to a bug fix or something, or or they've added a new feature and we're already incorporating the feature. Then our development stage of the package um can exist, can exist. So we've got we we upgraded to we upgraded. We uh, updated our version to a 9001. Um and our remotes, we need to depend on a non-standard location for. Um, AA package, because we're now looking at a dev version of AA package. And so that um, we're telling it where to find it, what um, what the path is to find that. And so this version of our package cannot exist on CRAN. Um, but when AAA package gets um, updated to 2.2 on CRAN, our package can go on CRAN again and that version. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's an example of when we might um, need a non-standard dependency. So I didn't realize that CRAN packages could depend on bioconductor packages. That was news to me. Um, so finally, the last, uh, one of the last things they co cover is this config needs. So this is also within the description file. Um, so sometimes you might have something that needs to show up just for your website. Um, and this is not, this is, hopefully we'll learn more about this later. I looked at some description files, but um, it seems like it's more for GitHub Actions related things and for websites. Um, yeah, so we'll leave that. So, okay, so the next thing, you need to export all of your functions to exist in other people's namespaces um, or, or to exist in your package namespace so that people load it, they, they have access to these functions that you wrote them. So um, if you've written your functions, none of them actually exist in the, in the package namespace until you export them. So um, you should think about what you wanna export. You should only export things that like you intend to kind of maintain and that other people actually need to use. So you might write internal functions that help you with your package, but, um, if you don't export them, then you don't have to write documentation and there's less of an expectation that they won't change. Um, so export things that feel more stable and that are actually the point of your package that have some cohesive um, intent. So um, if, if you're writing functions that are helper functions for you, totally normal, it is the standard is to write a utils.r file. And so if you look at a utils.r file, um, I hope this one has one, do, do, do. I can know my alphabet. No, this since this does not. Um, but if we go to where is something like tidyr, it's gonna have a utils. And so here, none of these are um, 
like this is not exported whatsoever. Um, so they've, they've written functions that help them in different ways, but there are no oxygen tags here telling you to export them. So these are gonna exist internally if you do three colons, but there's not necessarily gonna be documentation. There might be some documentation for it, but um, there's no, uh, so this one actually, if you call the help on this function on the, with you're gonna need to call it with three dots. I think it'll tell you about the expected parameters, but um, I think, <laughs> but the function isn't exported, so you can only access it via the three dot, the namespace. Um, so yeah, having a nice a nice utils file can be a useful way to organize things that you want internally. Um, okay, so re-exporting. So sometimes, apparently, you might want to make use of a function um, from another package and allow and export it in the namespace of your package. So the example they give is dev, there's this package, great package called session info that has the function session info and dev tools changes how session info, the syntax for session, not the syntax, the uh, like underscore. <laughs> um, so it imports the package and it exports the function. So um, if you do this, um, you do still list the package in the imports field and include import and export oxygen tags. And there will be this man slash re-exports um, for the documentation. And actually, let's just go to DevTools for that. Um, so, um, if you look at their R file, they've got a, hopefully a re-export file. Maybe not. Maybe not. DevTools package. Import from. All right, let's look at session. Where did session import from? Import from. So we're importing it. We're exporting it. So exporting it and they're importing it. And oh, un, never mind. Sorry. And so they are importing it and they're exporting it. And then under man, um, there should be a re-exports. So when you look at the so sorry, this is this is created your the um, documentation file for the re-exported stuff, and it links back to the original documentation. So if you look at DevTools. Um, and you go to reference and you're like, eh, where are these? Ooh, so all of these functions are re-exported from other packages. And so if you click on one of these, all of the documentation will show up, except it's really just links to other documentation. So, um, and you can see what packages they came from. So this will just, this is on the package down website for dev tools. They're all collected together in the, in the, um, but then it links to the, original documentation. You don't have to write your own documentation for this function that you're exporting. Um, OK, and so then the last thing they cover is um, imports and exports related to S3, S4, and R6. <laughs> so um, you can export methods and stuff. Um, I don't, I have not gotten to this part of advanced R. But um, so you can export a method again, like I said at the beginning. This so here you're exporting the generic count, and here, uh, or the yeah, and here's the specific method count on a data dot frame on a data frame, and you would give the same raw oxygen tag, but um, when do document when raw oxygenizing happens, um, it'll use two separate. Um, the syntax in the namespace will look different for the method versus the um, specific the specific method versus the generic. So, um, yeah, they go into how to how to deal with importing and and exporting those. Um, and there are some some apparently tricky use cases there. So if that's the land you're in, that's that, and that's everything for this chapter. The real quick, like super confusing thing with S3 is if you have an internal function that has S3 methods, 
you still want to do the export trick on the methods. So you just say export and it doesn't actually export it. It just makes it available as like a thing that R will find. Otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like S3 just won't find that method. Okay. Um, and so that was something that took a while to wrap my head around. Export doesn't, for a, for a method, export doesn't really mean export. It means make it available as an S3 method to things that can see the generic. Okay. Okay, so yeah. you're saying that if, if you do export on an internal fun on an internal method, whoa. So all that really does is the S3 method step, the you know in namespace it, it creates that S3 method thing, but mm -hmm. the generic still isn't exported, so it's not really exported from your function. Okay. Or from your package. And that's necessary. And so this step it's, is you need this in your namespace in order for your package to work even if in order yeah in order for that method to be a method okay. <laughs> so yep um cool uh yeah the the thing that i thought was funny is that dev tools actually depends on use this um and so they i don't think they point that out as an example of depends but uh it is one of the rare ones. Um, so if you I, library dev tools, it libraries use this. Yeah, I patches. thought they actually mentioned that as one of the problems when they never mind. Mm -hmm. I thought it was because of keeping it clean for people when they split things out. It, it's again, I mean, it's similar to the test that thing that use this and dev tools are developer packages so they break the rules okay um they they expect you to have them running basically so um and there's i'm sure there are reasons like uh that they they're i mean they used to be one package um as part of it and so um yeah i think that's all i had i, I put a thing in the notes about um like it, a cautionary tale along the lines of why you shouldn't export something that you, you don't want to support basically it, it's only tangentially related but there's the um the story about uh the red cross in world war ii and how veterans doesn't matter whether they were in world war ii if they, they any, like all veterans hate the red cross because the red cross gave away donuts for a little while and then stopped giving them away because they were forced to stop giving them away um, and therefore the Red Cross is evil because they took away the free donuts. Um, and so it's the same thing. Don't don't export a function if you're going to maybe stop exporting it at some point because people will hate you for ever having exported that function. Um, and yeah. there's also that you'll also break things. So <laughs> it's maybe more so than the donuts, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all my thoughts on that. Thank you for that. I have a question, <laughs> but um, do other people have questions? Oh, good. Thanks. Um, so my question was, so there was this mention of, um, okay, so I guess I'm, a lot of the things you can do because of use this and dev tools are interactive for package development, right? And so you can break these out into these. Uh, you can use these in a package slash package. So dplyr slash package.r um, package document thing. So you could reasonably quickly recreate your namespace and description files, right? Um, but I've only done everything interactively. So then the it seems quite conceivable that you could accidentally have things in there that are uh, appendages that could be deleted that you created at some point and then you realize that your function doesn't need them. Um, and so you've deleted it from your code, but you've still got this uh, um, thing imported in your name namespace or in your description file. So like, how do you cleanly kind of start over? And is the answer to that part of the 
CI CD stuff because then your package is is being built from scratch or something like I don't know anything about action about GitHub Actions actually in reality. So yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. But is there some way to kind of start over, or what would that be? Um, delete it and okay. see if your package still works. So, so. <laughs> you're saying like you should just just go to the just delete everything that's not your source file R files and just start rerunning things. Yeah, uh, like and. and so the the two ways of importing, you know, the use import from that puts it into the into that one file or putting it with the help where you use it. Like I go back and forth about what I prefer myself because of that. Because okay, I don't want to have to put it everywhere that I use it if I've got something that I'm going to be, you know, like you know, glue glue is a good example. If you are using that in your package, you're probably using it all over the place. And so where do you put the use imp or the uh, import from tag? Well, putting it in one central place makes sense. But then other functions I'll have where I'm using it in one place. And so it'd be nice for it to be next to that so that if I change my mind, I just delete that import from in the Roxygen and it goes away. Um, I mean, I trust they work on more packages than I do. So the central file probably makes more sense most of the time. And the, I, you know, the only way to clean it up is just every once in a while, delete things from there and see if your tests still work. And if so, you okay. must not be using that anymore. Or, you know, uh, search all to try to find where you used that function and see if you're still using it. I don't, I don't think, yeah, there's nothing that will tell you, hey, you're importing this function, but not actually using it um, because the act of importing it tells every, like, implies that you're using it and nothing can tell that you're not. Um, but yeah, that's it. Like I have um, actually last week I was uh, editing someone else's package and it had uh, a million imports and one of the, actually one of the last things I did but, you know, a thing I wanted to make sure I did before I was done is kind of go through those and see what does it actually use? And it was almost none of it, but mm. it was just that. It was leftovers from while they were developing it. And so I cleaned most of them out, but it was um, very manual. Like I, I was going through just like deleting swaths of things and seeing what broke basically. So um, that is something where... Uh, uh, you know, using Git and, you know, GitHub or something, using something where you have backups of everything makes it easier to do because if you delete things and you shouldn't have deleted things, you can always get it back. Um, and it's the other, like, that's another thing that, yeah, find in files, control shift F, super useful that um, I'll just put in, in chat. Yeah. Sometimes when I have a function, I don't know if on an object, I don't know if I'm using it, I always check <laughs> in all our files if I really use yeah. that object. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely use that. I think part of the interactive, beautiful nature of use this in dev tools means like, yes, going through the book, you know what it's doing, but um, <laughs> if I'm just looking at my namespace, I don't necessarily know why all of it was created. Um, or where it came from. So just like, how do I start over? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, like, especially for internal packages, I think, you know, at import is very common. Just import a whole package. Um, and I mean, technically it's not that awful although it's putting it all it like is attaching all of that stuff and so it doesn't need to do that it's going to gum up memory um it's so like as far as functionality or whatever putting the import from everywhere that you use it doesn't um break anything it just makes it hard to scrub it back out um and so I, I've gone through a stage of doing that, of wherever I'm using a thing, I don't assume that I'm importing it from already. I just put it in the documentation of that function. Um, because if that function is using it, then it should kind of own that. But then I'm, you know, I switch back to now it's from one central place because use this makes that easy. 
<laughs> um, huh. Oh, man. I, oh, <laughs> finding files didn't work. I wouldn't, my, my whole workflow would be broken. I'm sorry to hear that, Stas. Um, yeah. Another one that kind of related to this, um, we will, actually, it's not in, almost certainly not in the book, but in testing, they just implemented, actually, <laughs> right after the book uh, was printed, they added new mocking options in test that. Um, that you can like replace for the purpose of a test, you can make a function do something different than what it would otherwise do. So you mock the function. So for example, if you're gonna be hitting a server with some function in your test version of that function, you might want to, you know, um, not hit that server, like just return a stat, a result that you have saved or something like that. Um, and when you do that, you want it to be a function that like you control you, local to your package um, just because of the way that the replacement works. And so I've have a I have several things now where I have a version of a function that is my local version of that function, but all it does is call the packages version of that function so that I can mock it. Um, I don't like they just added this functionality and test that or kind of added it back um, in like, I don't know, right before uh, our studio or posit count. So like August or something. Um, I don't know that there's a standard for that yet, but so it, it basically, if you're going to use someone or if you're, if you need to mock a function, you need to own it. Um, and even if it's just a copy of the original function. And so that makes it's like a, another way or another reason to do the import from in so those. Are you doing the re-export then? It, not, not exactly. I can't remember if they're, oh, well, number one, I don't want to export them. I only want them, I want my package to own them. And I, I could just, I think I could just do an import, use import from, but I had some reason that I wanted to, oh, well, I wanted to make sure that it was only my local, like the places where I actually use the local copy that I'm mocking because they talk about, well, what if something that you're calling is also calling that function? You don't want to muck around with that too much. Um, and so anyway, I, I always like make a, you know, like if it's uh I, I can't think of an example, but let's say it's, you know, something from um, hit or two, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, actual um, rec perform, I would make like dot rec perform in my package that just does hit or two rec perform. Um, right you're just now, not exporting that. Yeah, I, I import from hit or two rec perform. And right now I'm putting that import from directly on that function, my copy of that function, because it's only there for mocking. And so it kind of tells me this is a, a unit of code to make testing easier. Um, also, sometimes I'll put like defaults on my version of it and things like that. Um, yeah. So, and it's, yeah, it's um, Stas talks about how uh, things like API or DBI calls are things to mock, um, database calls, anything that has authentication, any and anything that like leaves your package and it, the test could break because a server is broken or something. Um, you want to mock that stuff so that you're not, well, so it's not slow and annoying and everything. Anyway, so those are a separate case for importing. Um, there was, so I read, uh, just a, like a general programming book that was talking about how you should like control everything 
in your package or in your your code. And so I was trying out kind of always importing from and having like my own copy of everything kind of like so that I have some, I have the ability to re replace that function within my code with my own copy of that function if the package breaks without having to change all my code. And so if my function is calling uh, rec perform, I would re or not re export, but just import from uh, hitter to rec perform. And then all my other functions would wouldn't have to namespace, they'd be using, you know, my version of it. And then if it changed in hitter two, I can just change my version, you know, write my own version and replace it. I don't think that's actually worthwhile anymore, but that was the thing that I was experimenting with because then you, you are less, it's easier to deal with if something breaks in someone else's code that way. Um, but it's harder to deal with if something doesn't break in someone else's code. So why put the burden on just in case, you know, I think within the R world, things tend to be cleaner. And so I haven't, I don't think that has been worthwhile, but anyway, that was the thing I was doing for a while. Um, we are, yeah, again, as usual, I think we're, we're over. So we should probably, I should, I should stop blabbing. <laughs> uh, thank you for the blabbing. Very All right. Oh, and next week it's me. Because um, I want to learn about licensing better, and so I grabbed the licensing chapter. So, so I wish.